Hello again and welcome to Arch Eats, the show for St. Louis food fans that gives you some information that maybe you didn't know about the local dining scene. This episode of Arch Eats is sponsored by the Repertory Theater of St. Louis. With me as always is my cohort in crime, Cheryl Bear. Good morning. Good morning. Good frosty morning yes, to you. A, and we will cover that later. That's going to that's gonna come up a little bit later on. It's our teaser. Yes. Today we're going to talk about trends we see in St. Louis for 2024 and a few we'd prefer not to see. And then we'll end up with a rant about what irritates us about some St. Louis restaurants in the winter. But first, it's what we can't stop thinking about this week. Okay, I'll go first. For me, this is brand new news. Southern closed this week. A great Nashville hot chicken restaurant. Rick Lewis and Mike Emerson opened this place. They spent a lot of time down south, down in in, in Nashville, down in Memphis, down in the, the, the roots of, of hot chicken land, uh, learning about how to properly prepare it. They were bringing the first Nashville hot chicken to St. Louis, and they wanted to do it right. I just remember a lot of the things that they did are things that I didn't know. They put the spicing into the meat. They did the meat marinade, so the spice isn't in the breading. Huh. I didn't know that. The only spicy part of the breading is what they coat it in. Yeah. It's that spice mix, which it's a powdered mix that they mix with a little of the fryer oil. That's how they make the paste, and it's a very light. It's almost like a glaze. It's not like a paste. I thought that was pretty interesting, and that's what made it better. And the other thing that they did is something that Mike did at Pappy's. They had a door person there to meet, greet, and answer questions and basically entertain the people in line. And a lot of the time, that was Rick Lewis. And I just think that was something that was crucial to the success of both those places. They, you got to meet the owner. And what Rick Lewis did, which was really interesting, he offered chicken at one of the lower spice levels just as a barometer, just so you knew how to order once you got to the head of the line. I thought that was brilliant. Southern changed. They took uh, chicken breasts off the menu, which met with a lot of disagreement uh, in favor of uh, just chicken tenders. Nothing wrong with chicken tenders, but you got to have a chicken breast on the menu. And I think what happened to them is, as I was trying to analyze it, is they took a long time to open up after the pandemic. Yeah. I'm not sure they ever regained that lost business. Anyway, Southern closed last week. It was unfortunate, but, you know, to me, it was the first Nashville hot chicken joint in the city. And for several years anyway, it was the best. It was spicy, but it was so flavorful. You didn't, you, you couldn't stop. That was the problem. And there's other Nashville hot chicken places that have come up since then. Uh, Chuck's, a place called Heaters in Kirkwood. Uh, Grace Meat and Three, where Rick Lewis moved on to. He still sells, I think, the original recipe. Mm -hmm. And then a place that I know you love, Sunday Best. Yeah, their hot right? chicken's wonderful. The tenders and the, uh, the bone-in version. Well, George, if you're talking about Southern and fried chicken, of course, one place that I can't stop thinking about, and I recently discovered this little trick or hack, I don't know, in the parlance of our times, if that's what we want to call it, but um, Frank and Helen's is a university city institution. It's been there forever. I have memories of my grandma sitting there getting a reservation, sitting down with Helen in one of the booths at this place, and I mean, it's been there for decades, but they do roasted chicken, which is a pressure cook style of chicken that results in very juicy meat, but this very light but super crispy coating on the outside. Well, the roasted chicken, it's wonderful on its own, but they also serve a creamy garlic dressing for their salad, which I think it's the best salad dressing ever to be invented. I'm, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say this. It is the nectar of the gods. And the owner told me that I should get an order, a side oh, dish. No, no. Oh, yes. Oh, no. Of the creamy garlic dressing and dip the fried chicken into it. And I'm telling you, it's it's transcendent. Highly recommend. I'm shaking my head, I but know. I respect your palate. <laughs> I, I, and I love Frank and Helen, so uh, I did not know about that. Have you had the dressing, trick. though? Yes, I think I've had it on a salad. Oh. I'll have it I on never anything. thought to put it on chicken. I've dipped uh, my we'll cheese just, garlic bread in there. Right. I'm not going to lie. It's uh put put that on it's your special. Put that on your to to do list, folks. Frank and Helen's chicken with the dressing. Ten out of ten. Recommend. All right. We'll be right back. In the heart of the ocean, a tale of revenge unfolds. 
Moby Dick, live on stage at the Repertory Theater of St. Louis. From February 6th through the 25th, don't miss the drama, the danger, the hunt. Get tickets now at repstl.org. And now, back to the show. So that brings us to the main part of our show, where we're going to talk about some trends, and we're going to take them in, and try to be organized and take them in in categories. We're going to talk about some food trends, some drink trends, some restaurant trends, and some service trends. I think we've got something to say about all those, and then I think we're going to do some trends we'd just like to see go away. Some of these are things that we've already seen. There's been some groundwork for them. Others, you know, we haven't seen here at all. We're getting our crystal balls out. I think one of those things that um, we really have seen a lot of groundwork laid already are plant-based Meats. I don't know if we call them meats meat alternatives. Yeah, it's um, hard. You have to, you know, use the the quotation marks yeah. all the time because uh, w- whenever you say, you know, it tastes just like steak or it's it's a vegan steak, you have yeah. to put steak in quotes. But I think there is, you know, you need that reference point because that's what they're going for with these. And one of the most exciting people to watch is Chris Burtke at Vegan Deli and Butcher, which opened kind of later last year in Bevo Mill, you know, he's been doing this for years. He was kind of one of the first people in town to do like the vegan versions of all your fast food staples, like the Jack in the Box tacos and the Big Macs and all of that. He's the poster boy for he vegan is. chefs in this town. He really is. He's so, it, it's Too just young really to be exciting. the OG, but he kind of is. He kind of is, to be honest. So he's really doing, um, at his deli and butcher shop there, he's taking some of the classic deli dishes. Think smoked salmon, think corned beef, pastrami, and he's doing them with plant-based meats. And I I find that really exciting. Um, Another place, and we've actually talked about them before. um, I think I talked about them in terms of biscuits and gravy, is Looking Meadow, the coffee shop in Maplewood. The vegan sausage on those biscuits and gravy is fantastic, but they also do a wonderful version of a French dip with a vegan version of roast beef that a local woman named Amy Simmons makes for them. I mean, I'm telling you, I am an avowed meat eater, and this stuff's delicious. And, you know, we talked about this a little bit, too. There's a a local product called Harvest Shreds. Yes. And it is just, like I said this before, it fooled Carnivore George. It's it's locally made. It's plant-based. It's a sustainable shredded meat alternative. Yeah. And it goes great in taco salads and tacos, and it's being used in a, a bunch of uh, Mexican restaurants in town. And it's just an excellent product. And I think you're going to see a lot more of this product and products like it in 2024, both at the grocery store and on uh, restaurant menus. I know they have it at Ivy. I know they have it at Grace Meat and Three. Look for it when it's becomes available. I think I think it's available now at Parker's Table, but I'm not sure. And before we get off of Chris Burtke, we were talking about some of the things he does. Yeah, he does. He's created all these meats, but he also does, you said he does a, a quote, salmon. He also does a lobster roll. No. A vegan oh, lobster roll. Oh, I have roll. not seen that. And I haven't tasted it, but I've seen it and it looks pretty much like a lobster roll. And um, Anyway, that is another trend that's coming is this whole faux fish trend. This yes. vegan faux fish where they're making uh, scallops and, and snow crab and lobster out of, uh, you know, plant-based products. And I, I read there's a crab cake out there that tastes like a crab cake that's made out of enoki mushrooms and celery root. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, what kind of magic is that? I mean, I don't even see how that's possible, but I know what some of these guys can do. Anyway, it's going to be a very significant year for plant-based meats and goodies. I agree. And I think, you know, the bottom line on that is it's not just, um, you know, it's not a segmented thing anymore where you find it at a vegan restaurant, but you won't find it anywhere else. I think that's part of the trend is a lot of like restaurants that appeal to all different diets are finding that they want options for a variety better, of people. You better because somebody in your group is going to be a vegan or a vegetarian. Yes. You better accommodate for them. The other one that I saw, I haven't seen it here yet, but there is an alternative chocolate that's made without cocoa. Oh. Think about that. I, and apparently I it, it has the same taste, smell, and melt of original chocolate and has no cocoa in it. I mean, that's what I say. It's going to be a, just a fantastic year. I can't wait to see that stuff come down. The yeah, all the food science stuff's very interesting for sure. 
what else do you have that you're excited about? Well, um, we've touched on some of this, this whole tinned fish trend. Uh, ben Paremba has a lot of it on the menu at Bar Moro. These are these, you know, don't think, uh, you know, sardines and, and some of these older tuna in a can. These are higher end uh, scallops and finer fish, if you will. This is the fancy can it, fish. It is, and, <laughs> and some of them are eight dollars, and some of them are thirty. But you're going to see a lot more of these. They they've been kind of in the news, and so much to the point that there are now C cootery S E A cootery boards with all this stuff, all these smoked fish, all these tinned fish on them. And I thought, and we talked about this, why not throw a few of those Annie Guns smoked shrimp on there when we're putting something like that together at home? <laughs> this I sounds think, great. I think you're going to see seacootery boards. I, I this can't year. get over the term seacootery. Uh, I mean, I, I, I thought, I, yeah, I'm always known for my, you always like that, look at me, you know, cross eyed when I come up with these cutesy terms, but that's one of them. Archie should do like a dictionary, like the word of the year is sea cootery. I'm officially crowning that our word of the year. That that works. How about dry aging? Now, we've seen dry aged meats. They've been on local restaurants for a long, long time. But now, you know, with the advent of Sado and Indo, Nick Bognar comes along and dry ages fish, which I thought was something new for St. Louis. But apparently that's been done in in different cities. and, And Nick was the first one to bring it here. Now I was talking to Ben Paremba about that. He goes, he goes, I've been doing that for a long time. I just haven't told people about it. Huh. So he's been dry aging different meats. You know, I, I'm not really too sure. I know he was doing, uh, I think, some duck, and maybe what really interested me was he's going to be dry aging vegetables at some of his new oh, restaurants. Oh wow! I don't even know what that means. I know that dry aging takes the moisture out of it, increases the flavor, sure. makes it more tender. So anyway. Creative dry aging, that's one for 2024. Wow, that's, that sounds interesting. So there's one food item that I read about recently that does have local ties, and I just like everything about it. It's called garlic, G-A-R-L-E-E-K, a cross between garlic and a leek. Oh, that sounds and heavenly. unlike a leek, you can chop the whole thing up and use the whole thing, which always drove me crazy about yes. leeks. But uh, what's interesting about that, it's being developed by a guy, Dan Barber, uh, Blue Hill at Stone Barns in New York. That's where the Galenas worked sure. before they came to St. Louis. And this guy up there has developed all these seeds and all these uh, unusual vegetables. And uh, when he developed something called Honey Nut Squash, Vicia in St. Louis with the Galenas was the first one to use it. So my contention is when garlic comes down the pike this year, that we will see it and probably see it at one of the Galena's restaurants because they're buddies with Chef Dan Barber. How about that? You can use it root to tip. It's got the benefits of both garlic and leek. I mean, why didn't we have this sooner? What more do you want? Now someone just needs to have the shalik or something because shallots are the next one on that list that are amazing right that's another word for the exact dictionary we'll put the shaliks on our secuterie board the other thing that i think we're going to see more of is uh is wagyu beef uh it's it's appearing on on a lot of local menus both japanese which is the highest end and australian and american wagyu it's just ridiculously expensive which i thought this is really going to have a limited appeal And I'm wrong about this. Out at Napoli 3 in St. Charles and Napoli C, they have a a Wagyu steak that's $200, $225. I was just at Napoli C, and they displayed it. It's this giant tenderloin, just beautiful, and... But the cost is two twenty five. So is that a shareable thing for people? Like you get it with a group? I think it is, but it's like, you know, how many of those do you sell? And surprisingly a, a bunch of them and in napoli three they sell all kinds on the weekend so that tells me there is a market for this even at that high price point and they make a big deal of it they have the, the seal of uh, or the uh, certificate of authenticity it takes up a whole menu page and they make a, a really big deal about it but this comes from a company in st louis a locally owned company called standard meat club And we've talked about them before. If you you go to their website, they have pages upon pages of Wagyu meat. So Wagyu is, is, it's been around for a while, but it's going to be a big deal, I think, in St. Louis in 2024. You're going to see it on more menus. And somebody's got that money to spend. It's it's not me, but uh, it's selling in restaurants. Well, and even seeing it in different applications, like we've discussed on here before, 
from um, the catalog you're discussing. You know, we could see it in hot dogs. We could see it in sliders. You know, it doesn't have to be the pomp and circumstance of a gigantic steak. I think we're going to see, see it. See Wagyu bologna? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, why not? It's a thing. And I kind of thought just due to the cost, it was a passing fat. Not true. Another one that won't be a passing fad for sure is cannabis cuisine. Yes, that is definitely something that I just see sky's the limit opportunities in here in town. I think we've already seen the popularity of that, you know, with um, cannabis themed kind of dinner clubs, a yeah, this, catering company rooted buds, you know, I mean, they're right, a cannabis right, catering right. They company. They won the best cannabis caterers in town. I didn't know that was a category, but it is. Apparently it is now because it can be now, right? And um, there's that chartreuse dinner club. Right. We've talked about them. Yes. She sells out those, I think she does three or four events a month and she sells them out instantly. I mean, instantly. And the other one that I saw also sold out. So if you are interested in doing this, you have to be you know, set alerts for it. It's probably harder than getting a reservation at Wright's or wherever. But, um, you know, uh, Proper Cannabis has done a couple of, or at least they've done one that I know of with Balkan Treat Box. And, um, you know, Spencer Pernikoff, who's over at Proper, right. he is very connected to the St. Louis food scene. He's just been someone who's, you know, he had a great blog, Whiskey and, and Soba. Got, and he's a great photographer. He's an amazing photographer, but he's over at Proper. And because he has those longstanding relationships with some of the best chefs in St. Louis, I think it's going to be exciting to see these dinner collaborations between Proper and some of the biggest name chefs here in town. I think we will see that happen throughout the year and beyond. No question. Let's transition to the bar scene. What do you see happening? There's been a lot going on in 2023 in St. Louis bars and, and the cocktail scene. Yes. Well, I think the the trend is that there is a bar scene. I think a lot of people were, you know, lamenting the loss of bars in during the pandemic. I think that was one of the biggest losses, you know, just that kind of communal watering hole. And um, they are roaring back with a vengeance and not just you know, kind of your local dive bar, but we're talking these really creative experimental cocktail bars, high end, uh, very interesting stuff. One of the places that you and I've talked about that I think is the gold standard of what's going on is none of the above. Gerard Crafts Place, which just opened in City Foundry. High end cocktails, swanky digs, just a beautiful spot. I mean, that's just kind of the place that you want to go to to have a wonderful cocktail. But they're not the only ones. Um, I've had wonderful cocktails, even though it's not an as swanky. It's almost like an intentionally un-swanky. nostalgic, unswanky vibe is Tim's Chrome Bar, right. also in Bevo Mill. We're talking about Bevo a lot today. But um, that's a really fun place, and they're doing fantastic cocktails there. Chelsea Fister is the bartender or bar manager, I guess, of the place. And that's been a lot of fun to watch. New Society on South Grand in the basement of uh, Grand Spirits. That's a partnership between Michael Fricker and Meredith Berry, both of them esteemed bar minds in St. Louis. Two of the best in town. Yes. And then the one I'm really excited for is Good Company, which is going to open in the Grove pretty soon. Those are the Good Ice people, the people who are doing those really high-end, beautiful, filtered Ice of all shapes and sizes, some of them embossed and engraved. Um, I don't know what the term is for ice, but um, they're doing those for a lot of cocktail bars around town. So I think we're seeing these very elevated bars. How about no alcohol and low alcohol cocktails? Is that was that a fad or is that a trend that's going to hang in there? I don't see it as a fad. I mean, I think we're seeing that there's almost a generational change in views of alcohol, you know, kind of in terms of wellness and things of that sort. So I think a lot of people are still wanting that, you know, kind of collegial, communal feel of going to a bar. They want to feel festive and upbeat, um, but they don't want to do it with booze. Yeah. They just want a well-made cocktail. They don't want the alcohol. And I think, and not to throw cold beer on this subject, but due to the popularity of 
let's just say, mind-altering substances, which are now <laughs> legal, I think that that will affect the consumption of alcohol. Absolutely. I've been told by bar managers, bartenders, that it has. No and, doubt. And uh, they're still selling them. But uh, again, these no alcohol, low alcohol uh, cocktails are way up just because other people are <laughs> finding other things to do. That's great. I think another thing that's exciting related to bars coming back and these really, really elevated cocktail bars is I did touch on it, um, the elevated ice, you know, for by surface volume, it's one of the major, maybe the most major component oftentimes of a cocktail. And I think bars are realizing that they don't want to put any old ice in there, that that is as much a component of a great cocktail as your base spirit and whatever you're putting in there. And I think we are going to continue to see these very elevated ice options, you know, for uh, that are being prepared in all, by in all different like the, shapes yes. and sizes. And they're very hard and there's very little drink dilution with these. And that's very important to these bartenders. They don't want their drink water down. And Absolutely. With these very hard, very fancy uh, uh, ice cubes, uh, that doesn't happen. Well, and as a consumer, you don't want that either. You don't want to be two sips in and already have the experience diluted for you. Right. So Literally. I think that's a good company has really been, you know, kind of, uh, the gold standard of that here in town. And I'm excited to see what else happens with that. And before we get off bars, I want to do, a, uh, talk a little bit about wines and a couple of the trends that I hope will happen. I hope that we will see more low to mid-priced wines on wine menus. Those wines are out there. I see them at all the liquor stores and wine stores, and I just wish that restaurant owners would put more of them on there because, again, the, the, the price to go out to eat is so high. Help us out how, however you can. Uh, the other thing I like that I saw first, I think, at Avenue was the uh, wines poured at the table. They bring the wine out, they show it to you, they pour the glass right then and there. You know what it looks like. There's some interaction going on with the server. It's just why every place in town doesn't do that, I don't know. Okay, it's another step, but still, it's just a, a great hospitality nod. And the other thing that they do there, again, more folks are doing this now, is offering a half glass. They'll come back and say, would you like a glass of wine? No, how about a half glass? And I go, the heck is going to turn down a half glass of wine? That's right. exactly what we need right now. Right. Well, I like that. And I think that fits in with the you know, non-alcoholic trend sure. or your movement. Let's, let's back off just a little. Exactly. You don't have to back off completely, but no. maybe just a touch. Let's talk about restaurants. There was, uh, it was, uh, 23 was an interesting year in restaurants. There was a lot going on. There was a lot of uh, uh, thematic restaurants that uh, came about. And I know some of them you reviewed. I did. Well, a few of the ones, and I would like to see more of these, and I think we are going to see more of these, are the um, regional Mexican restaurants. I think that we, you know, there is a time and a place for a great Tex-Mex That's spot. just what I was going to say. You know, don't get me wrong. shade on Tex-Mex, but. Yes, I am the first person to go to Mi Ranchito. Like, let's just say that, <laughs> right? Another U-City institution. I think it's been really exciting to see some of these chefs do some creative, innovative things that really get to the heart of traditional cuisine. Taqueria Merida is one I'm really uh, looking yep. forward to. That is uh, Chef Aaron Hernandez, who's been with the Vicia folks for a while now. This is really a place that is um, harkens back to his childhood growing up in Southern California and going down the Baja coast with his family. So it's nostalgic for him, but it also represents just a thrilling place. I mean, here we are in the cold right now. I can't talk. I can't think of somewhere more aspirational than eating these wonderful, fresh, vibrant fish tacos. Yeah, he's a fine dining chef that has gone the route of, of tacos. And I'm so happy for him because now they have a brick and mortar or they will see yes. in the Central West. And remember, they were. It was a cool place. It was an outdoor restaurant at Vicia. Oh, it was so neat. And but then in the in the winter time they moved to Winslow's Table, and then they'd move back to Vicia. The, the part of it was kind of screwy for me, and it just wasn't cohesive. Now he's got his own brick and mortar. That's the way it should have been in the first place. Yeah. So, well, I think you, they were excited about doing it as a pop up, and then realized how wonderful it is yeah, that it just needed right. its own. Yep. Its own thing. And the other higher end one that I'm thinking of is Malinche out in uh, Chesterfield. Yeah. Oh, it's even further than that, George. It is, is it? in Ellisville. It is. Uh, That's all Chesterfield to me. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Well, yeah. 
It's it's my new stomping ground. Sorry, so. West County folks. Thank you. Thank you, Malinche, for giving me uh, something to cheer about out there. But Malinche is wonderful. I mean, that's another regional Mexican restaurant. It's been around for a little while, but you're just getting these flavors that are so exciting there. I'm also excited about El Molino de Sereste. That opened up toward the end of last year. That is Alex Henry, who has Sereste in City Foundry. Outstanding Cochinita Pibil. He's taken that concept and opened that in its own standalone place south on King's Highway. And that is just this beautiful, elevated, very traditional restaurant. With a big mill in the window. El yes. Molino is right in the window, which is cool. And it's it's in use. It's yeah. not just, a, just an artifact. So Yes. And this is him bringing the food that he experienced in his childhood, you know, going back and forth between the States and the Yucatan. You know, he's bringing that here. So I'm hopeful that we will continue to see more of these regional Mexican restaurants because, wow, the food's good. We also noticed in 2023 a whole bunch of bagel places opening up. You know, I I just thought it was great. They're all different. They're all, most of them are pretty good. And with the closing of the bagel factory, that just left this huge void. And all of a sudden, three or four guys jump in. And I wonder if that is going to continue uh, in 2024, whether we're going to see, you know, will, will there be a bagel shop on every corner like a bakery? See, I think this may be where you and I differ on this because I I am thrilled at the bagel scene here now. I and mean, we have some great places and I am here for it and I frequent them and they're wonderful. I feel like we've reached peak bagel. I don't huh. know, right? I don't know if we're um, going to see one on every corner like a total access, you know, urgent care. I don't necessarily I, I, see I, bagels I, on every corner. But. I, I hope it doesn't get to that. But I think <laughs> I think different neighborhood. I think every neighborhood needs a good bagel shop. The other thing that I saw that I think we should mention is this this whole ghost kitchen thing. Is that a is that a fad? Is that a trend? I think it's going to continue with the popularity of pickup and delivery foods. You're going to see more ghost kitchens and I think the coolest thing that's going on there is what's going on at Urban Eats and has been going on there for several years. There's several kitchens under one roof. It's almost like a stationary food truck, if you will. It gives yeah. guys with an idea a chance to test the waters for a year or two and just to see if anything, you know, if, if it's a good idea or not. There's a place called Mr. Suvlaki that was a farmer's market staple for a couple of years. He's got some great products. He's moving in there. And a place called Wheelhouse Fish Company that's also coming to the Urban Eats space. And I won't go into it right now, but read about that one in St. Louis Magazine. These folks are have a fishing boat up in Alaska. They, they, they split their time between Alaska and St. Louis, and they're going to do a little food stall at Urban Eats. So shout out to Urban Eats. I hope to see more places like that in 24 that will give more of these uh, fledgling restaurant guys a, a chance. Yeah, I see that. And uh, Black Salt, you know, the very popular Indian restaurant uh, that uh, from Chesterfield, they're opening up a spot in a ghost kitchen out off Hampton. So, you know, part of me thinks that is that a trend that was only during the pandemic? But you're right. I think people have made a habit of dining in. So I think we have opportunities for Maybe some of these concepts that have brick and mortars, you know, in some ways they're almost going opposite rather than starting out as a ghost kitchen and then using that as a launch pad. Some of them seem like they've had a successful thing here in a brick and mortar, and now they want to take that to different neighborhoods and a ghost kitchen's a low stakes way to do yep, that. Yep. It's a perfect way to do it. Early in 24, there is, I think it's the CES, I think it's a consumer electronic show maybe that's in Vegas. And it's all things uh, electronic and, and techy. And it got me to thinking about, the first thing I thought about was the guy from Alibi Cookies who did that cookie bot. Oh, he has yes. The, he has that cookie machine. That is so fun. In Dogtown. And it still exists. And uh, I, I was reading up on the, you know, food-related uh, innovations coming. There are pizza vending machines that are out there now. Oh, goodness. I didn't know of. To the point that you can become a licensee for these. It's called Pizza Forno. So if you want to become your own little pizza lady, you can do it in whatever neighborhood you want. Anyway, that's something new. Is that like the bagged pizza at the Critics' Choice Awards that everyone was laughing about? <laughs> I, don't I still know you... don't know. But anyway, I was intrigued by it. But I read an article that says that the best things that I ate at this show 
And number one and two were ramen and stir fries, which I thought was fascinating. And this guy is a foodie. And he said it was shocking how good they were and how fast they were prepared, both of them in under two minutes. And wow. Anyway, point of my story, we might just see things like that with the cost of labor and you know everything else. That's a possibility, good or bad. I'm not going to weigh in on it, but uh, you know, it's interesting that those two foods were the best that this guy tasted. So keep an eye out for Interesting. That. Vending machines beyond the Cheetos. Yes. As far as restaurants go, uh, we wrote a story a while back. Again, it was uh, a guy named Danny Meyer, who most of you listeners know who he is. He, he actually coined the phrase and he put the thought out on a, on a tweet that says six o'clock is the new eight o'clock and that early reservations are where all the action is. And that you remember how the eight o'clock reservation was, that was it. If you got the coveted eight o'clock reservation, you were the God, you were solid. And now it's gone the other way. And I think some of this is pandemic related. Everybody's just getting out at different times. Those of you out there that make reservations have probably seen this, that the 5.30 and 6 o'clock reservations sell out before the 7.30 and 8. And I am in that camp. I am. I always joke around that I'm an early bird diner looking for my decaf and my trout <laughs> almondine, but I love it. And I think that goes hand in hand with probably a trend we've seen for a couple of years now that people are dining out with their kids. They're dining out as families and you want to make sure you're home in time for bed, you know, for their bedtimes. So, or if you have to get a sitter, you have to do an early one. And I think they're great. And those of us without kids are dining out at happy hour and we're hanging out at five, five thirty, And then all of a sudden we can have that six o'clock reservation and it all works out great. We're all just tired. I think that's what it boils <laughs> down to. We're all just painfully tired. <sighs> so let's talk about uh, service trends. There's been some changes. Uh, one of them that I thought was interesting was what I'll call hybrid restaurants that are part table service and part fast casual counter service. And, and I, I uh, specifically talking about a place called Momo out in Rock Hill. And he always wanted table service, but he couldn't do it because he didn't have the labor to do it. So we started off as a fast casual restaurant and that was going very well, but there were still people that wanted full service. So what has he done? And I think there's going to, you're going to see more of this. Part of the restaurant is full service and yeah, another part is counter service. So no matter what, how much you want to be waited on or how much you want to be left alone, you can be happy at a place called Momo. And I think that, again, it, it's hard to staff a place. So the restaurant guys don't like to do it. And, and uh, restaurant folks sometimes want the attention, sometimes they don't. So I think these hybrid restaurants I think you're going to see more of this because there are people that love fast casual service and there are people that love full service. And this is a way to cross over. And sometimes the same person loves them both, depending on, on their different day. days. Yep. Exactly. So I think it allows you to become loyal and become a regular at a restaurant, depending on, you know, what you need and what you want that particular day. And then some of these places that are fast casual have a, you know, incorporate a QR code somehow, some way. Some of them are at the table. Some of them are at the, you walk in and you scan the QR code for the menu. You're, you're making a face over there. So Don't get I, me started I, on okay. the QR codes. I hate them. I hate them so much. Let, let me back up. I recognize that there are some positives to them. I recognize the sustainability issue of not having to print menus. I recognize, you know, you don't want somebody's funk on your hands when you're picking up a menu you know it just seems a little more sanitary in our kind of post-covid or well yeah it was a it was a covid yes, reaction and it was a good sure. one the thing i don't like about them is when you scan a qr code you are holding your device in your hand your eyes are downcast and you are interacting with your device you're not interacting with the person i think that's a great point across from you so i feel like it really takes that communal aspect out of dining I find them very hard. You know, I'm not looking at my server. I'm not looking at my dining companion. I'm looking at my phone and maybe I'm even talking to them while I'm doing it. But I just feel like such a phone zombie when I'm doing it. And it it drives me crazy. And especially when you're talking about wanting what appetizer are we going to have? What are you doing for your first course? You're not looking someone in the eye. It takes that human connection out. I totally agree. And in, in, in a similar vein, 
uh, I've noticed this, you know, we go to websites to look for the menu. It's this, it's what everybody judges a, a, a restaurant on. Let's show me the menu. What do you, what do you got to offer? And instead of seeing a, you know, verbiage menu, you see, scan this QR code for the menu. So you're looking at your laptop and now you have to get out a phone to check out the menu. And I go, you know what, this is too much. I, I don't think we're, we're, we're there yet. We have not arrived at that doomed doorstep. I think when you just have to, when you don't have to print a menu on a, on a website anymore, I think it's, I think it's wrong. So, and, and this kind of dovetails with the whole kiosky thing as far as self-service mm -hmm. and, and doing everything yourself. And, uh, are you a kiosk fan? When you walk into your favorite Taco Bell, do you, do you go to the kiosk? Or no, I hate them. I hate kiosks too, but again, I'm a Look human connection. You. I do. I'm coming down hard on them, but I'm a human connection person. I like that hospitality. I like that interaction. Maybe I have a question about something and I always feel like those things are great until they're not great, which is about probably 65% of well, the time when they break down and I don't know what my password is and this, that, and the other. And then I just sound like a, you know, grumpy old person waving my fist in the air. Well, but, I, and I, I thought it was interesting. I think it was at a Taco Bell. I, I walk in and you go the, to Taco Bell. Oh yeah, I feel like this. Oh is yeah. A, well, that's another. That's a whole other here. segment. Huh. And uh, so I walk in, and and the counter person is also the cook, and he yells out from the kitchen station, "Go ahead and use the kiosk, and I'll take care of your order." And I thought, well, isn't that interesting? You know, there isn't a counter person at all anymore. So that again, we're we're seeing a little change there. So I'm going to admit my Taco Bell habit to you in the context of I once crunch went... Wrap cr crunch Wrap Supreme. See, I can't even say it, but I love it. I'm a classic crunchy taco kind of gal. <laughs> crunchy Taco Supreme. All right. We're, we're, but we're... Um, the uh, I tried to go through the drive through and they wouldn't let me place my order at the drive through. I had to actually order on an app to then pick up through the drive through. I thought see, that was interesting. See, I think it's too. getting I think it's getting a little too complicated. But I did see something I liked at the new Shake Shack out in De Pere. You walk in and there's all kinds of there's this this bank of of little uh, kiosky machines. And everybody's using them. But if you don't want to use them, and there's a guy there that says, please use this kiosk. But if you want to go up to this counter, I can help you up there. And he's very gracious with an open hand. So, again, this kind of hybrid model. We, we want you to use the kiosk, but we're not going to force you to use the yeah, kiosk. People like options. I think, that's a, I think that's a good thing. Okay, so you've like been, been getting down today, getting down and dirty. <laughs> and I, I have a, a, a trend to die for 2024. And there's going to be people that are going to take me to task for this, but I, I'm really tired of these giant eight inch tall sandwiches. Oh my gosh. And I know about the Instagram ability and the appeal of them. They look great, but let's face it, there's no way to negotiate it. There's no way to eat it. I don't even know how you cut the thing in half. My contention is make them wider and not taller. Yes. I'd be fine with that. Just make it so that we can negotiate it. Yeah, okay? so we don't have to unhinge our jaw like a python yeah, exactly. to like eat I, your sandwich. Yeah, yeah, you don't need a signal beacon on the exactly. top of the thing. <laughs> so anyway, that's my that's my trend to die for 2024. Okay, so this week's micro rant. It's freezing cold out there today. We've all gone to restaurants that are entirely too cold in the winter. And I know you. we talked about this earlier. There's something that restaurants can do pretty easily that they don't do, and it drives me crazy why they don't do it. There is. And I actually, I think this is fresh in my mind because I just had this happen to me at an unnamed but very tasty restaurant that I went to last week where it's a small spot and the door opens and you get this Arctic blast no matter where you are sitting in the place. And the thing that that I find interesting is there is a simple solution for it. And, yeah, you don't have to build a breezeway. No, We're not saying to do that. No. Although I've, that would be nice. It would be nice. But I've actually seen places do something as simple as they take a rounded curtain rod, shower curtain rod, Something of that sort. Yeah, a half hoop. Yep, a half hoop and hang a curtain from it. It kind of gives you a little bit of a, a door space buffer. But even having that fabric there, like really thick, like velvet fabric, for instance. First of all, it looks nice and dramatic. And secondly, it really makes a world of difference. And I, you know, it can't be that expensive. The payback has to be instantaneous. And let's face it, 
when you walk through that curtain, it's like you've kind of got a big reveal. I think exactly. there's some value in that, yeah, too. Yeah, there's the drama of it. It's very so, nice. So restaurant owners, think about that. You know, we, we're tired of stamping our feet in the wintertime, and it's really an easy problem to solve. I bet you could solve that problem for 20 bucks. Where are you getting your velvet? Uh, right. <laughs> Amazon. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> and on that chilling note, this brings this episode of Arch Eats to a close. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. There are links in the show notes to all the places we talked about today. We encourage you to follow Arch Eats and share us with your friends. And remember that we put out a new episode every other week. You can also subscribe to our newsletters at stlmag slash newsletters or follow us on Instagram at St. Louis Mag or follow me at George Mayhew.